So the talk today is building a culture of delivery using Lean DevOps. So for anyone who was hoping for like a really technical talk, that's not what this is. But if you want to come afterwards to our booth, right over here, CTO.ai, uh, we've got a ton of command line stuff that we'll show you. Uh, I'll give a little bit of an overview, but then I'll get into the stuff that's uh, really important. So first about me, um, what's really important is probably to understand how I see the world. I'm a little bit different in how I've come to my, uh, come to my career view. Um, I'm a self-taught software engineer and entrepreneur, dropped out of high school early uh, to pursue technology. Um, I started my career off in the shared hosting days working for a company called Hostopia. Uh, this was back when you, know, you used FTP and that was uh, DevOps. So um, additionally, I've spent an equal amount of time working at agencies. So I've done a lot of front end work, but I've also done a lot of back end work servers. So I've worked through the whole stack. And that's really informed my view of developer tools. I care a lot about developer experience. And uh, over the last, let's say five, 10 years, I've worked with about 25 different startups to implement different DevOps strategies. I've worked with early stage startups, I've worked with growth stage startups, and I've also worked with enterprises like Zillow who acquired my last company. So I've sort of seen a different view of how um, DevOps specifically can shape uh, the lens of software development in any business. So uh, of course, I'm just gonna start out with a quick plug for us. What we do at CTO.ai is we basically provide um, uh, platform, we call it the shared command line for teams. It also runs in Slack. The idea is that you can, in 90 seconds, build a polymorphic workflow or developer experience that runs in any terminal, but also in Slack. Um, Slack is one of our investors and we're really into the idea of chat ops because we think it lowers the barrier of entry for complex software, which ultimately DevOps is. Um, and the reason we do this is a lot of companies are hiring junior talent and the idea is how can you enable them to uh, ship uh, product as, as fast as possible, but also with sta stability. Um, and in the market, there's never been a time before where it was harder to attract the senior talent you want. Ultimately, what we think about a lot is this uh, fabled 10X engineer. And a lot of people think it's one person who's 10 times better than everyone else kind of sits in the corner. They're kind of disgruntled. If you ever watch Silicon Valley, HBO, it's the carver. Uh, but we think it's one person who can enable five people to be two times more productive using technology. So it's this idea of leverage in an engineering team. So um, I'm gonna just summarize what I think of as DevOps because this is a, a loaded term that everybody throws out there. Uh, you know, you're gonna go hire a DevOps. You know, it's kind of like a silver bullet that we use. Uh, but I really subscribe to the ideology of um, companies like AWS who go on to say that DevOps is uh, philosophies, best practices, and tools that enable a company or a team to ship software at a higher velocity than your traditional software practices. Um, and you notice I put philosophies and practices out there first. Um, this is why the talk is about building a culture of delivery, because the idea of DevOps is you're building a culture of shipping software. So what is the impact? Um, you know, we look to the masters here, uh, companies like Puppet that have been around forever in the state of DevOps report has gone on to say that companies can ship up to 200 times faster uh, and 2.5 thousand times faster lead times for their projects. Uh, and one of my favorite stats comes from the Stripe coefficient, um, the API gateway Stripe did this report uh, where they actually assessed uh, the landscape of software development and they, they talk a lot about um, how it's not just how many developers companies actually have, it's how they're being leveraged. So you can have 100 developers and 100 developers can be less efficient than a small, well-tuned 20 engineers uh, who are using really good philosophies, practices, and tools to ship software quickly. And my view of this is, has been informed, a lot of it has started out in the early stage. And so when you go through some of the challenges that early stage companies have, um, this is something that really, I think, highlights how important it is to create this idea of leverage. Um, so the first is hiring. You can never hire enough people. It's hard to hire people in the market that are senior enough. Uh, there'll be a million jobs left unfilled in the US alone. I don't know what the stats are in Europe, but there's never been a time where companies were more hungry for talent. Um, the Stripe coefficient says that their, uh, most executives would say that access to technical talent is a bigger threat to their business than access to capital. So think about that for a second. In a startup also, everything is a first. 
Success is often implemented bottom up because you have to take a lot of initiative, but it's measured top down through executives, CEOs, founders who are thinking about the business lens. Um, and so that requires a lot of accountability for engineers. They have to, you have to hold them accountable and they have to hit timelines because especially in a startup, time is the one thing that you don't have. Um, what we've seen in the last few years is that technology is actually way more complex and expensive than it ever has. Things like Kubernetes are actually making um, development, software development, harder than it ever has been before. And just generally in a startup, you never have enough money to solve all these problems fast enough. So uh, when you look at it through that lens, that's usually a good place to start because I think about DevOps as a progression through time for any given company. So what is the state of DevOps as I see it? Um, I think it's incredibly fragmented. There's so many different tools out there. When you throw in open source, there's even more. Um, and it's impossible for developers who have been tasked for tasked with implementing software to really like arbitrage this landscape and come up with one cohesive solution uh, because there's just so many options. It kind of it kind of looks like this, and it's no longer just DevOps is like here's cloud or here's um, AWS or spinning up servers, you now have a whole spectrum of SaaS tools that fit into uh, what is commonly thought of as the DevOps lifecycle. Um, anything from uh, your typical SaaS tools uh, to CI, CD, AWS, it's a pretty broad spectrum now. And so what this means, as we even center in around more of the technology pieces, things like Kubernetes, um, is that many companies out there are actually struggling to implement this idea of what is DevOps. They think it's something like Kubernetes, they think it's something like cloud, um, and never before has it been more complicated for them to adopt these tools. And these tools are fairly complex, so it takes a lot of learning. That's why you need to hire people who are more senior. Um, but for most startups, at least early stage companies, this can feel like a snake swallowing an elephant because these technologies are actually coming out of the larger cloud companies like Google, for example, who have hundreds of infrastructure engineers who are building these complex systems. And then as they go down market into mid-stage businesses, um, there's sort of this microservices and distributed philosophy that becomes the new trend. Uh, and at the end of the day, you really got to evaluate your tools because that can be actually add a lot of overhead into your development processes. Because over time, as you're implementing tools, as an organization is growing, ultimately you see this sort of negative correlation between the number of people that you have and the efficiency of an actual team. And what happens is early on, you sort of have this flat organization, a lot of people work in Kanban, that's awesome, like those are my favorite days because you know you got a small, well-aligned team. But as you move towards a larger organization, you start dealing with things like you know system observability, continuous deployment, and you move into like the real big company stuff like security and compliance, you inevitably have this sort of diminishing return over time. So what we think of is um, the concept of Lean DevOps is really about adopting tools just in time. So just like Kanban came from manufacturing practices and the idea was just in time development, um, there's a similar philosophy with DevOps where it's if you shouldn't try to adopt everything, what you should be trying to do is adopt things over time that fit the stage and the organizational practices, ultimately the business outcomes that you're, you're aiming for. And so I've already kind of called this out, but the Stripe coefficient says that because of the landscape is like this, there's actually, and this is, a, this is a true stat that they put out there, 300 billion loss in developer productivity every single year. Dramatic pause. Think about that. 300 billion is lost in developer productivity. That's a lot of inefficiency. And as they've said, access to developers is a big threat. The reason that I see that this is happening is internal teams, companies, who are implementing technology, they're not afforded the time to spend automating the tooling and the best practices because they have a lot of pressure to ship features. So ultimately, if we're gonna solve this inefficiency problem, what we think of at CTO.ai is how do we actually lower the cost of automating your work? So a developer spends more time shipping features that deliver business value and less time wrangling these complex softwares uh, that make up cloud technology and the DevOps spectrum. So our, our philosophy is, is really about making these automations, these, these tools, extremely distributable um, and also very intuitive. Our, our idea is that if we can make it easy for devs to automate things, but then also distribute them, and this is different than your typical bash script. Your typical bash script, this is great, a make file, this is great, but it's hard to actually get exponential leverage across a large enough team. Um, and so as we think about this problem, what we've come up with is this concept that we call an op. And essentially it's a container, a uh, Docker container, with a word that we call op, which is an, a, an operation that achieves a complex and objective task. 
And the idea is that as you automate something um, and you distribute it through your team with the, through this intuitive experience, you're creating leverage for the other developers on your team. We wanted it to run everywhere because what we found was is development teams were building tools that were only accessible in the command line, or only accessible within little teams amongst. And as a team grew, and you went from sort of one small team that has a cohesive repo that everybody knows where it is to a team that has maybe 50 different microservices or 14 different departments, um, managing things through make files and bash scripts actually started to break down. And so we really thought a lot about Slack um, and chat as a way to distribute that leverage to teams. Um, but also, ultimately, you also have to be able to run these things through web interfaces um, and, and real-time event-driven models. But when you can set up a paradigm like this, where you can get accessible distribution to any kind of automation in a team, this is where you're able to create that 10x model that I'm talking about. Um, as you can see here, the idea being that a lead developer who's empowered to spend enough time automating away the low-hanging fruit or creating a platform for the success of their team can easily distribute technology to that team that allows them to ship faster. And so this could be things like CI CD pipelines. This th could be things like Terraform scripts. I and mean, we have a ton of these approaches over time. Uh, what we're trying to do is bring that stuff into the place that collaboration is naturally happening. And that right now, uh, in a lot of ways, is, is challenging things like Slack. So this brings us to the question of how do you build um, a culture of delivery. So there's a lot of things that don't really rely on the technologies. I said earlier, I started out with philosophy and best practices. Tools are really just a way to embed the philosophy and best practices into an organization and distribute that knowledge. Um, but if you get really into the philosophy, um, one of the things I always preach to, to growing teams is to to stick with lean process for as long as possible. It's one of those things where as soon as your process starts getting complicated, it's exponentially harder to go back. So to the extent that you can know that up front and think about it, um, it's gonna it's gonna help you. And one of the, the people who I, I look to um, is a guy named Dan McKinley who wrote a really amazing blog post uh, many, many years ago now called Choose Boring Technology. And the idea is that you really only have three innovation tokens to spend on any given problem. And you have to decide how you want to spend them. Some companies, some engineers will try to spend that on inventing a new database. I'm not sure why, because things like Postgres work really well. Um, really, you want to spend those on the things that are going to move the needle for the business and not on innovating around the infrastructure. Unless you're in some sort of really progressive space where you know distributed models and, and that technology advancement is your core IP, you're better off choosing boring technology for the most part. And another thing that, that's really important that, about that is it also makes it much easier to onboard new team members. So in a number of companies that I've worked with, we used to set these sort of shocking rules, as Ben Horowitz would say, where we tried to have a, a general rule for onboarding that everybody deploys on day one. It doesn't matter what you deploy, but you have to be able to deploy something to production. And the reason for that is your onboarding really sets the expectations for a development team. And if what you say up front is, hey, we're gonna make it super easy for you to deliver value directly to customers, but it's also gonna be safe and you can roll back if you make a mistake, you are setting the expectation rate away as soon as that person joins the company that you have a culture of delivery. And so that's really important. Um, ultimately, you're creating a platform for the success of these teams and then it comes down to prioritization. So I think one of the things engineering teams struggle with a lot is essentially how to prioritize their best work. Uh, many product teams use something called a, an ICE score, or it's also commonly called a RICE score, uh, which is essentially a way to prioritize work. So if you think about the potential impact, your confidence of that impact, you add those together, and then you divide it by the level of effort that something would take, you ultimately have like a really rapid way to determine the priority of every given task um, within your software development life cycle. So most people have seen the graphic on the left if you're into DevOps. Um, what's interesting about this is it, it actually enca encapsulates um, a lot of product management ideology. And this is something that we tend to push back on a little bit because um, you know, story points and engineering productivity has usually been told through the lens of uh, story points and project management. This is great, uh, measuring velocity is great. These are all things that you should do. Uh, but when you think about a pure engineering team, you have to set KPIs that uh, really encompass the engineering focus. And so if you, again, try to simplify DevOps, instead of having this sort of 
infinite loop that we have on the left hand side, what we've tried to do is create more of this ideology of a circular loop. Starting with the things that they need to implement first. The first thing you need to be able to do is commit code. Then you need to be able to do code review. Provisioning servers, deploying to those servers. You need to be able to manage incidents so you don't have downtime, and you need to be able to measure things. Um, these are ultimately, like, if we were to bring down the barrier to entry of what you need to do to have a good engineering practice, these would be the most important things. The other thing is, as I talked about earlier, you have to really think about how you structure your organization. Um, a lot of times when a company starts off uh, or an engineering team starts off, you sort of have this flat organization. There's not that many managers. Communication scales. You can just look to the person to the right and left of you and, and communicate. But as you grow into more of a matrix and agile organization, you start to have these small, well-organized teams. Um, but information doesn't always travel horizontally as well as it should. You're usually going to have a point person on each team that's usually an engineering manager um, or a team lead. And um, ultimately, you have somebody making business decisions. The challenge with this is that you effectively start to create these centralized information silos. And as you start to shift from generalists, meaning like full stack developers who can build full stack applications to more specialists in your organizations, and often early on, this is thought of as the DevOps engineer, but a good example is a security engineer. You start to run into this challenge where centralizing those um, roles and responsibilities actually don't scale real well across the organization. And this is where we started to see the rise of DevSecOps, where we use things like continuous integration to implement security policies. But we you know, use some of the data here from the State of DevOps report, and what you can actually see um, is a growing trend of companies who are moving away from centralized specializations in engineering teams to more distributed specializations. Uh, you can also see in large organizations, centralized is more, is more common still, um, but the trend is that most companies are starting to move towards either having a centralized security function, uh, but each delivery team also has a designated expert, um, towards a completely decentralized uh, expert for security. This is common in a lot of um, really really um, lean organizations. A company like Spotify is a really good example. If you, if you look at some of the, the talks that they've done about um, how they're organizing their engineering teams, um, they use something that they call um, guilds. We think of this as kind of like a, a lattice organizational structure. And the idea is you have these vertical business units that are have priorities that are focused on delivering business value, but then you start to have these horizontal specializations, things like DevOps, security. Um, and what that allows you to do is really layer in that specialization across the business units to distribute it while still keeping a centralized sort of knowledge function. And what they do at Spotify is they actually have these sort of like offsites and breakouts for people who are like either in the security you know uh, team or they're on the the DevOps team. That allows them to like go learn together about that specialization and then go back into the organization and distribute it amongst the teams. It's a really powerful way to to, to distribute the the knowledge of these specialized um, tasks. So um, it comes down at the end of the day to, for a lot of people to technology and practice process tax, tactics. Excuse me. The reason that I think a lot about tooling um, is that it enables companies to empower more junior members of their team to take responsibility for sometimes mission critical systems. And this is really important because you inevitably are gonna have a bottleneck in your more senior um, and your most senior engineers and leadership. So to the extent that you can use tools to offload that knowledge to other people who uh, can take responsibility of, with it without having to worry about failing, that's really important to being able to scale an organization. Um, the other thing I think about as I talked about is so you want to start on with focusing on strategies that have high velocity and this is kind of like the lean startup model but if you turn that around on your actual software development practice what's good about that is you start with something that's going to have the highest yield as possible the highest velocity as possible but then as you adopt more process and tactics over time you inevitably have this sort of you know moderate diminishing return as long as you're, you're mod mindful of it. And if you focus on maintaining that, uh, that velocity as long as possible, the idea is that you should have a sustained yield over time compared to competing organizations. It kind of looks like this. So the graphic of the orange is there is like your people in process. So you're, you're adding more people in process. The green line is what your, your typical velocity trend would be over time in any organization. Um, but the yield there the, between the green 
and the blue, that sustainment of velocity is really what we think about um, when we talk about lean DevOps and leverage. So the longer you can sustain that, the more productive your team will be over a longer period of time. So there isn't really a conclusion to offer you. I apologize for that. Um, but um, there isn't a perfect process. You're going to have to think about the organization that you're building. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. But the general um, best practices that I've always tried to, to follow as I think about this um, Tools, you want bottom-up adoption of tools, but you want those tools to create top-down transparency. The more you can create a conversation around actual work that's data-driven, the easier it is um, to provide autonomy to engineering teams to move really quickly. A flat organization is a, is a huge advantage, and the longer that you can sustain that, um, the better, because if there's one thing that doesn't scale, it's communication. You have to be adaptable. So over time, as you are adopting new, you're hiring more and more, and you're going from 10 to 25 to 50 to 100 people in your organization, there's these sort of natural leveling points. And we most commonly see companies struggle with this around 25 engineers, where the CEOs will say, hey, you know, I'm seeing a diminishing return for every additional engineer I hire. And that's usually where the light bulb goes on. And they say, oh, hey, I need a CTO, or I need a DevOps is what they'll say. But really that's just sort of like the critical mass point at which you start to see that communication breaks down. Um, we can all really only manage 150 relationships. So why would it be any different within your organization as you go to 25 different people on your team? And then ultimately, I think the, the thing that separates really strong um, engineering leaders and, and DevOps individuals is not just that they're system thinkers, but they're able to sort of manage this natural dichotomy between um, velocity and stability. So you often heard this said by people at Facebook, move fast and break things, and then later on it was move fast on stable infrastructure. But there's a natural dichotomy between these two things. So as you start to have more stability, you're inevitably gonna you know, lose some of your velocity. And that trade-off um, is ultimately what you're managing as you pick tools and you pick processes in your organization. So the takeaway that I would hope to give everybody here um, who is interested in DevOps or is adopting in their organization is a bit of a call to action. Um, we think that there's going to need to be about another 40 million developers come online in order to fill the talent gap um, over the next five to 10 years. And there's never been a time where cloud technology has actually been um, perceived to be more accessible, but actually been more complicated, uh, at least in the last 20 years that I can remember. And the question that we often ask anyone who's in a DevOps role or is rolling out DevOps practices in their organization is this question of leverage. Who are you enabling? Who are you enabling to um, be two times more productive? Um, and I think that's a good measure of, of how you should think about um, the use of, of, of DevOps and ultimately how you're building your culture of delivery. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, like I said, come see us at the booth. We have a bunch of demos. We'd love to show you how we're bringing uh, DevOps tooling and your developer tools to the place that collaboration happens. Um, we love Slack and chat ops and all things command line. So we're right over here, just on the other side of this wall. Uh, and we'd love to show you what we're all about. Also send us an email anytime. Thank you.